I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm your host Arushi Kutaria. I'm a junior research scholar at the Takshashila Institution, and today with me I have Preeti Kutaria, who is the CHRO of ICOR at Wipro Limited. Today we'll be talking about something that's been on everyone's mind, which is the move back to offices. Now, before the pandemic struck, it was everyday business to go to office, attend all your meetings in person. But the pandemic has changed the job we feel for. A year after the pandemic is supposedly receding, we need to begin navigating what the workspace is going to look like. This has given rise to something called the return to office policy. So, Preeti, do you want to maybe tell us about what the return to office policy debate is really around us today? Hey, thanks, Arshi. Thanks for having me here. So, this is one of the new areas coming up, and not that we have all the answers yet, but it is something which you cannot take your attention away from because uh, globally the pandemic is is receding. Yes, I don't deny that there are pockets in some countries where people are seeing a surge, but. More or less, I think the expectation now is that it is it's more endemic, and you know people need to get back to normal life. And with normal life comes the obvious question of coming back to office, and that is where this whole concept around uh, back to office, return to office, or RTO as we are calling it, and organizations uh, currently grappling is how do we get our colleagues back? You know, how many days a week? How do you design the new workplace? So that's the policy which is evolving. I'm sure at every industry level, at an organization level, at a government level, because the pandemic did not spare anybody, you know. And some of the myths got broken. So that's the double-edged sword as to how do you really articulate one, uh, which still gets you people back, and you still don't lose talent in the way because we can't ignore the great resignation which is happening in the background. Right. So I think one way to understand it or to summarize what exactly the debate is, is that most companies are today choosing between three kinds of policies for returning to office. One being that you call everybody back to office. Second is you adopt a hybrid model. Or third is you provide more fully remote opportunities. Now, something that we, as you mentioned, we've noticed over the course of the pandemic is this idea of hybrid working or working from home becoming more popularized. In a recent report by PwC, there's been it's been noted that there's been an increased investment in tools for virtual collaboration, IT infrastructure to secure virtual connectivity, training of managers to manage a more virtual workspace or a hybrid workspace where you know offices are also becoming more adept to a hybrid model because conference rooms are being enhanced with virtual connectivity, communal space in the office, and you have unassigned seating in the office because now people can come and go as they please. But I think something that has been plaguing my mind is what exactly does hybrid mean for an organization? Does it mean you come in on some days? Does it mean that certain roles will require the people to come in, but other roles could not have to come into office? What exactly does hybrid mean in the conversations that we're having today? Oh, very uh, relevant question, and I think the way to look at it would be not to you know ignore. the other realities which have struck people during pandemic you know for instance there has been a fundamental shift in the role of work itself you know in overall life for generations under the age of 40 and which is typically the large employee base for any uh, growing organization today you know wherein people have actually come out and said work is only one part of life you know not the whole of it many of us grew up as to go to a place where work is now the expectation is work needs to come where i am Uh, many of us are considering working only with non-Indian uh, organizations for more flexibility and a better personal life. This is also true in a social sector because people are leaving jobs today at an all-time high without having a job in hand for better lives. So, and hence, I think the whole element of how do you, you know, really design work and the very pertinent question you asked about hybrid, you know, up. Uh, today people are willing to change jobs uh, you know 44% of the gen z as well as 38% of the millennials if we are 
making them shift from a location of their choice. And the reality today is, as we are expecting to come back to office, 40 to 50 percent of our colleagues across, and this is a common factor across industries, across organizations, are not in the location in which they were actually working when pandemic struck. So fast forward almost 24 months, people are now used to living in maybe a smaller city, saving rentals, uh, living with their parents uh, who take care of their children. So it's a lot more a different lifestyle, you know, and we all tell people that it takes 21 days for a habit. Now, people have been living in this way, almost 40 to 50 percent of our workforce uh, in this uh, lifestyle. So it's not going to be easy to expect people to break and then come back to office. And that is where this whole concept that if productivity has not got hampered, if security breaches have not happened, what exactly can pull people back to office and why do you need people back to office? And that is where, you know, an interim way that, you know, can we really get everybody back to office? The answer is no. Do we need people for certain specific uh, pieces of work? Maybe the answer is uh, lying somewhere there and which is where this whole element of hybrid, which everybody is grappling. Nobody has the answers yet. And hybrid per se is, you know, you decide certain days, you decide certain activities which can happen in a group, uh, which can happen, you know, inside a space where people come, interact, connect. And I think one of the Biggest concern today every organization is grappling is how do you get the culture of the organization inside or, you know, assimilated, percolated with the employees because people are not coming to office. Uh, There is no smell of the place. There are no water cooler talks. There are no gossip conversations at the cafeterias. There are no intermingling of discussing, building bridges, building bonds, having networks. So the entire fabric of the culture is weakened. That's one big factor which is driving today as a design, you know, foundation that we need people back in office to also build the culture of the organization. And with the great resignation happening, trust me, 50% of the organization today is which has joined us during the pandemic. And this is across universally. They have not seen our office. Uh, They have not met their managers. They have not met their colleagues. And they just have no bridges and bonds. You know, their only transaction is with the project team or with the, you know, the task group with which they work. They come on Teams call and they log off and that's how life is. So hybrid somewhere is trying to evolve a concept wherein for certain activities, uh, for certain innovation, for certain ideation, you get a group of people back to office on certain days where people really have those connections built, uh, you know, a sense of belongingness established and get that stickiness going because otherwise it's going to be very difficult, especially for large organizations to build culture to build a connected organization, which is going to be continuously innovative because, uh, you know, beyond a point working in closed rooms or closed, uh, you know, houses, it has its own comfort, but this piece is getting diluted. So I think that's where we are grappling, you know, whether it's few days a week or for certain activities or for certain messaging or for certain, you know, ideation of new projects. How do you really design that, you know, people look forward to coming back to office or back to their workplace? And that is where, you know, this whole concept of workplace 2.0, what should it look like, you know, in which way it motivates me to come to office because these five things will happen or these three things will happen at the office, which are not currently happening at the convenience of my home or, you know, working across the laptop with a bunch of colleagues on the screen. That's where we are today. Right. To just sort of build on what you just said, like there's, there's this exodus of people, you know, wanting to not come to office on a full-time basis and it's leading to companies adopting some kind of hybrid policy. And it is going to be this decision of certain companies to offer hybrid or fully remote work that might just give them a competitive advantage in not just attracting the talent that they want, but also retaining it given that it is offering people the flexibility that they've been looking for. But as you mentioned, it is a double-edged sword given that there is no company culture that is getting built up because of this. Second thing to also note is that if we do emphasize the fact that we do want everyone to return to work, it could lead to a large movement out of the formal workforce itself. This could be because, you know, for example, it could be because of general burnout with people having to constantly work over the course of the pandemic. It could also be because Certain people were able to take up jobs because they had, 
you know, they had conditions where they were able to work from home, but they wouldn't be able to make it to office, especially applies to female employees. So what, according to you, would probably be a good return to office policy to follow for an organization? And how do you, do you think it could play out in um, the discussions that are occurring across boardrooms today? Hey, thanks. Very relevant uh, question, uh, Arushi, out there. And I think maybe good to also pause and see the kind of work which some of the research firms are doing, the academicians are doing, because this is the hot topic. Nobody has the answers. People are figuring it out and insights are starting to emerge. One such recent survey, you know, by McKinsey and their quarterly update, I think they really threw up the question poorly for the leaders of the organizations to embrace that there is a gap between what leaders expect and what employees want. And it's time for leaders to get a little more real about hybrid because employers are actually ready. And in in this case, employers could be our leadership teams across organizations to get the employees back in person in significant numbers. Employees are not ready. And this disconnect is deeper than most employers believe. And like you rightly said, could actually spike in attrition and disengagement may be very, very eminent. So basically, you know, hybrid readiness will actually need a very conscious managing of trade-offs. You know, the first one being the tension between individual and organizational need. What is my individual need and, you know, what is the organization wanting to achieve? Second is a huge tension between short-term and long-term. Because in 24 months, uh, people have seen that work can happen. Customer deliverables are happening. Penalties have been at the lowest. Productivity has gone up. And employees have had the benefit, you know, while they have been stretching for long hours, work-life balance has been a big concern, but they have been in the, you know, the safe space of their loved ones, closer to their parents, closer to their families, saving on some of the, you know, expenses. And this, again, is a balance happening in their mind. And trust me, one of the other concepts which has been emerging is hyper-reflection during pandemic. And people have been actually pausing and asking, you know, is it really worth it? And that's where the whole trade-offs are happening, whether I really want to work for this company, uh, you know, is this job worth it? Or I just take a little bit of a cut, stay with my parents, stay with my extended family in a smaller town and have a lot more better quality of life. The third one is, you know, the tension between creative collaboration and individual productivity. Again, you know, both are important. Uh, Both lead to results for the business, but you need to balance. Similarly, the compelling reason to come to office. What is that reason which is going to compel me? I think we don't have answers yet. So at the end of the day, you know, some of this will need, you know, experimentation and organizations are starting to experiment, starting with our own organization, which is probably rolled out, you know, giving the option again, voluntary, nothing is being made mandatory at this point of uh, time. And three days a week, two days a week, whether you connect with your managers, you connect with your extended team, I think there is this whole emerging, you know, workflow configurations which are happening. And it's more about co-working environment, which is a lot about collaboration, creativity versus, you know, standalone office campus wherein people are working as individual contributors. And there is, you know, I know what is to be done. So I really don't need that kind of work to happen. And, you know, to look at it like today, a sales soft kind of an organization or somebody who is doing uh, innovation will need a co-working environment. Vis-a-vis a high-end technical product development organization, which has pieces of work cut out, say like, a you know, just to take a name, maybe, you know, companies like an Apple or a Cisco or some of the very high-end product companies may actually be very comfortable with the individual uh, way of working. Full remote, I think, independent efficiency, individual productivity is prime is when you will actually swing towards a full remote uh, working. And there are organizations today who have told their employees that they need not come to office because I think each one has a a KPI or a KRA to deliver and it's working absolutely fine. Vis-a-vis, you know, there is a need or an agility to change and expand. And, you know, in some of these, you know, the execution is not about individual execution. You need to come together reset certain things, redesign certain things. And again, here will be an element of, you know, people have to come together. Similarly, you know, a kind of a coordination when you're in a large, diverse project. And at times, uh, you know, the teams are growing or the teams are getting rammed down or you need to have people being a lot more fungible. 
you will need people to connect and have a you know view of the larger ecosystem in which they could operate and that again will be a balance you know so organization size small or large the growth orientation of the organization which is more about is it only about execution or is it about creativity you know i think these elements will come in as organizations design what my workplace you know or my hybrid design if i want to walk that path is going to look like because it's not about a fad it's not about a fashion that you know everybody moves to 3 days a week everybody moves to hybrid and says 30% people will come 70% will not come i think we have to pause as organization and see on you know on the on the spectrum where are we are we an execution organization are we a creative organization are we a small setup are we a large setup do we have work which is more individual centric or do we have work which is more innovative teams coming in designing conceptualizing consulting so i think these factors will be important and i think there is work which has happened across and today whether these are global organizations doing work of how the work trend index of 2022 will look like i think uh, you know 38% of the hybrid workers say that the greatest challenge of hybrid is knowing when and why to come up the office nobody has the answer yet 28% of companies have created team agreements that create team norms about hybrid work again you know we we cannot be over prescriptive here 43% of remote workers say they do not feel included in the meetings yet you know they still join onto the meetings 27 of the companies are still struggling they have created new hybrid meeting etiquettes to ensure all feel included because believe me when you have a hybrid meeting versus a typical 100% virtual meeting the people who are sitting in the conference room some 10 people these are with five people on the screen the people on the screen believe me lose out some of the side conversations of those 10 people in the conference room so how are you going to be more consciously inclusive how are you going to make it still effective so i think these protocols will need to be defined if these and these are here to stay you know uh, and i'm not saying we have it prescribed yet uh, but you will need certain protocols for meetings certain protocols of what will happen on the days when everybody is in office and how do you also decide what will be those days when everybody will come to office what will be those work design which will happen in the year because if i come to office and i log on to a teams meeting and i come back in the evening i have achieved nothing and i add to the stress of the employee of a one and a half hours or two hours of commute which is absolutely productivity loss and more stress so why should that employee again come to office tomorrow well, that's a big question on that note with those cd alarming statistics we'll take a short break hello 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 it's been another great week on the ivm podcast network On Think Fast, Varun and Sushita discuss the Twitter Sting operation and Jack Ma pulling out of Paytm. On Cap Gemini's Techopedia series, Sheila Ditya speaks to Anand Chandra Mali and Deepak Solanki about sustainable harvesting practices through digital farming. On the Wire Talks, Dar talks to author and translator Navdeep Suri about the partition and the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. On Marathi Kirki Tun, the Deshmukhs explore how animals and birds gauge their sense of distance in the environment. And on Big Talk about tiny humans, Devi Shoma and Meghna explain the right way to talk to children about sex and sexuality. We've got some exciting news for you. IVM Podcast has launched merchandise and our first line is out now. Head to the IVM Podcast website and click on the shop tab and check out the first collection of t-shirts. Do follow us on social media as well. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Apple, wherever you do that, that is really helpful for us. And do remember, you can also check a lot of our shows out on YouTube. If you go to ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube, you get a list of all of our channels. We're also doing a small listener survey, so please do help us out with that. If you go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey, it'll help us understand a little bit more about our listeners. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance, Jupiter, a digital banking app, and Capgemini. Get the future you want. Thank you so much. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. Welcome back to Katli our conversation where we left off this idea that every company is deciding what kind of policies it must make and all of these vary depending on what domain the company is functioning in so who according to you should be making these policies should it be the government making 
a unilateral policy or something maybe industry specific? Do you think it should be individual companies making these policies themselves and not having anyone to report these policies to, which could lead to wide disparities amongst companies themselves or could lead to some sort of offering the benefits war between companies as well? Or do you think it should be organizations that are representative of industry, something like maybe NASCOM that comes up and makes these policies? So who, according to you, should be the key actor in the formulation of these policies? I think there is no one right way currently and, and you know, very pertinent point you made about the industry. So four things, uh, in my view, will play a role as these uh, return to office uh, policies start evolving or I would say work place guidelines for workplace 2.0 evolve will be, you know, what is the technology capability of the organization? Because if you have to work hybrid, you really need to have the best of the best technology. Secondly, I think it's the customer segment in which you operate because end of the day, an organization will exist only if it has customers. So today, if I look at it, uh, you know, you have India customers, which are very clear that they need their employees back in their office premises within the IT industry. I have my global customers who are very comfortable with the employees still continuing to be in the remote tier two, tier three cities of the country and delivering. So I think the customer also will play a role. The business in which the customer is in will play a significant role because uh, today I have seen the BFSI customers are extremely strict, you know, about their firewalls, about their network security, about their breach of, you know, cyber hacks uh, issues. So the technology, uh, you know, maturity of the organization, the customer segment, which you are dealing with. And third, I think, is also the government rules. And these rules are now starting to evolve globally. So certain countries are mandating that if you are in a particular industry and you're seeking certain tax benefits, we need employees back into the office premise because the reason we gave you these benefits was because you will create jobs and you will work from this particular premise or building or setup or that particular segment of the country. So the government also will play a role. Today, we are starting to see within our own country, you know, and if I look at the IT industry itself, some of the state governments have already issued mandates that, you know, by so-and-so date, they need 50% of the employees back in office. By September 1st, many of them are expecting 100% of the employees back in office. So government will be the third lever, in my view, you know, which will which will be a deciding or a, or a kind of a role holder when you start articulating it because no organization can do it in isolation. So it's your technology maturity, customer segment, government rules and regulations. And end of the day, I think, is your philosophy of managing talent. Are you having the right talent in the places you operate? Or do you see pandemic or the hybrid model as an opportunity to actually increase your catchment area of the talent? And this talent could be, like you also mentioned, you know, the women talent or talent, technical talent in the tier two, tier three cities, which come in maybe at a relatively lesser cost but come in with higher stability, higher stickiness, higher retention. So how do you increase your talent pool? And that, I think, is actually currently uh, also being playing a factor where organizations have been flexible in rolling out offers, appointments uh, to their talent. And this is the talent which will also need assimilation into the culture. And hence, you would need them in office on certain days, but you will need to give them the flexibility. So what is going to be very important, I think, is, you know, the balance between productivity and ease, balance between, you know, uh, innovation and uh, flexibility and managing the customer segments. And employees today are desiring flexibility. I see this uh, pandemic as to be, you know, very, very big blessing for the IT industry. And maybe I'm a little biased having worked in this industry. It also gives you a large, uh, you know, opportunity to increase your diversity and inclusion and equity, uh, you know, of bringing in talent wherein you were initially having your own myths of people cannot work from, you know, if they're not in these locations. So employee expectations, the diversity, equity, inclusion, implications, flexibility, which has now become a way of life for employees, you know, who are wanting the job to be where they are rather than moving to where the job is. And wide range of, you know, preferences, you know, in terms of sharing co-work spaces. A lot of small startups have, you know, given away the large spaces and they are renting uh, places where people still come, still collaborate, uh, you know, and, and still are able to yield results. And somewhere, you know, 
we cannot ignore, which is going to play a significant role ultimately how you design this, is to strengthen the social capital, you know, of your own employee base who need to feel connected with the organization, who need to have a sense of belongingness to the organization. And somewhere, how do you get those values imbibed into that? So I think it's not so simple. Uh, while the expectations appear very simple, and uh, I think these will be a couple of pillars or levers which will play a role as you start articulating it on what is the best possible way to really design the hybrid uh, workplace uh, 2.0. Right. And I think, uh, as you mentioned, this role of, you know, how policymakers need to be slightly more aware of the repercussions that any return to office policy that they will make will have. I think one of my last questions would be, what, according to you, are some reality checks that policymakers, irrespective of who it might be at the end of the day, should keep in mind whenever they're drafting a policy um, that, they, you know, wants to discuss about how should people be returning back to office? What are some key considerations that cannot be forgotten that could have unintended consequences or unanticipated consequences on how the policy plays out in the real world? Yeah, thanks. I think it's a very relevant question, you know, to probably end the conversation while it may not again have a very simple answer. What will be very important here, Arushi, would be, you know, the leadership response. And I think the leaders will have to lead it from the front on certain, first, the basic agreement on how they want to design and then having training on key principles which aids the implementation. Because believe me, and it's a reality, nobody has walked this path before. There are no SOPs or standing operating procedures which we are going to, you know, uh, tinker with it, tweak it, modify it. Everybody is writing these new rules from the scratch. So what will be very important as a leadership response, which will really decide where this organization lands with, you know, with Workplace 2.0 or the hybrid way of working is balancing employee expectations and the organization needs. We cannot ignore that two years of the pandemic have completely shifted the employee expectations. The new workplace will need to balance both the shifted expectations and the organizational needs. A strong need will be, you know, clarity with fluidity. So organizations need to experiment with the new forms of work. Leaders will need both clear protocols, yet they will need to be fluid to allow experimenting and learning because we can't be rigid walking a path when we have not walked that path ahead. So there has to be clarity. At the same time, you should be open to changes as you walk that path. Third very important piece which will go in the design of this new hybrid workplace will be how do you create immensely human interactions? You know, building trusting relationships in person can, in fact, happen quite fast. But practicing immensely human interactions in a virtual and in an in-person mode is going to be very, very important. Very genuine conversations. How can you be empathetic? How can you have candid conversations? Because I think somewhere down the line, in the last couple of months and quarters, we've become mechanical. We've become very transactional. We forget to check how the other person is doing. And this is also taking away the employees far away from their individual managers or even to the extent the organization. So how do you have a design which is still having the essence of immensely human interactions? And last but not the least, I think, uh, you know, the hybrid workplace will allow for new choices around where and when work happens. You know, so work has to get redesigned. This is also an opportunity to really look at the way we have configured ourselves by consciously considering, you know, certain elements which don't make sense any longer, certain protocols, certain approvals, which don't make sense any longer. So how do you really redesign work? So I see it as, you know, how the leaders respond and they create this uh, future workplace along these four elements, you know, so that we don't. We don't get it right, I'm sure, at the first time. But as long as we are not missing any of these elements, in my view, we should be there collectively as an industry, collectively as a bunch of organization, or even the government for that matter across the globe, which is, you know, going to work with the organizations. And today, whether it is NASCOM, whether it is some of the other acknowledged uh, bodies and organization, I think are coming together to take the industry insights to hear it from the organization, how we are evolving, what is our initial experiences of asking people to return to office, and then probably walk that path wherein you co-create with the leaders, with the government, with the customer, and keep in mind that, you know, 
you will have clarity. You will need to be fluid. You will need to be flexible. You will need to balance customer and employee and organization expectation. And while you do all of this, don't lose the essence of immensely human interactions, which create the bond with the last employee who delivers for your customer. Thank you, Arushi. Pleasure being here. Thank you so much. That was a really insightful answer and conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today and being a part of this conversation. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila Inst or our website takshashila.org.in. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey where you can fill out the survey. We face a hundred dilemmas every day while raising our children and nurturing our families. Why not let science help us make informed decisions to solve our dilemmas? Hi, I'm Devi Shobha. And I'm Meghna. We host Big Talk About Tiny Humans, where we will help you unpack challenges around parenting and your child's development. And more importantly, we will equip you with research-backed strategies that you can readily act on. Tune in to our podcast every Wednesday on the IBM Podcasts app, website, or your favorite podcast platforms.